East Denver, how we doing? My name is M, and I work at the Akron Island Foundation as the head of the Anvil Project. But before I want to get to that, I want to take you back to 2006. Season 6, episode 11 of The Sopranos. The guy on the left is Vito. He wants back in the family. And the guy on the right is Terry. He's looking for a loan to pay child support. Now, for this, I need you to all forget that Vito's a dead man walking, and that Terry knows this and has no intention of paying back this loan. And I'm sorry to spoil that, but if you don't know by now, you had, you had 20 years to watch that. Anyway, so they agree to terms on a loan, 20 Gs at two and a half points, right? And then Terry says, you know I'm good for it. Now I want to unpack that right there. What does it mean for Terry to be good for it? It means he's capable of paying Vito back and that he'll do so at a designated time. So what are we really talking about here? We're talking about Terry's credit worthiness. Creditworthiness is how trustworthy a party is with regard to delivering on their financial promises. So let's look at how someone's creditworthiness currently is evaluated. And the way I figure it, there's only one of two ways. The first is reputation. This is how credit scores work. The thinking is basically this. Well, other financial institutions have trusted you in the past, and you seem to pay on time, so I guess we'll vouch for you. This is also how the mafiosos do it, too. Well, that and, you know, the threat of a baseball bat. But that requires trust. And what do we say in Web3? Don't trust, verify. So the more responsible path would be assessing creditworthiness through collateral. Putting something up of value that can be taken if guaranteed conditions are not met. Collateral comes in a couple different forms. One, illiquid assets. House, car, watch. And two, liquid assets, like cash in your bank or stocks. But let's start with illiquid collateral. These are not particularly efficient in their current TradFi form, and for this, let's talk about car loans. When you buy a new car and you get a loan, what's the collateral? It's the car itself, right? The bank is holding onto that title, and if you don't pay, they're gonna come seize your car. But think about how crazy that is, right? The bank has to employ somebody, or they have to pay a middleman to go repossess your car. That's convoluted, and then on top of that, they don't even know what condition your car is in. It could be totally beat up, right? And what if the used car market tanks? The bank might wind up getting pennies on the dollar compared to what they paid the dealership. This is a bad system, and because of that risk of default, repossession, and underwater collateral, the cost of that inefficiency is passed on to everyone in the form of higher interest rates and administrative fees. And even liquid collateral, is arguably just as inefficient. And this brings me to the crux of what I want to get across today. Sending money is not the same thing as being good for it. And that might make sense on the surface, and it might seem obvious, but when you look at it in practice, you'll start to see the inefficiencies. Think of all the times you've had to pay money when all you really needed to do was prove that you were creditworthy or good for it. Think of down payments, earnest money, escrow, security deposits, et cetera. The problem is there's no good way in TradFi to ensure your liquid collateral is going to be secured when it's needed to be claimed, other than for the company to hold it ahead of time or for them to trust a third party in the case of escrow. You're parting with your money just to prove that you're good for it in the future. This too is a bad system, and the implications are enormous. One quarter of a quadrillion dollars. That is the size of the credit industry when you add up all of those components. And all of them are subject to the same exact inefficiencies that we just identified. But there is a fix. Digital assets. Digital assets are the perfect collateral because they're both liquid and they can be provably secured on a blockchain. And on-chain collateral isn't just an innovative new way of doing things to attract crypto enthusiasts. This is an inevitability given the massive market inefficiencies with the status quo. And on top of all of this, on the consumer side, We've got new generations that don't want to play this game. They're not interested in this. And one example is what I call the Gen Z problem. Gen Z has two things going on that the market is going to need to adapt to real quick. And the first is they're not building credit at the same rate as the generations before them. They're less likely to buy property, and they're wary of getting into debt. They saw what happened to their parents during the 2008 financial crisis. So they're opting for debit cards instead of credit cards. And when they need credit for like a large purchase over time, they're going to BNPLs. 
like Klarna, Afterpay, Affirm, all those guys, who will offer them interest-free loans even though they might have low or no credit. So they're not building trust, they're not building illiquid collateral, so what do they got? They've got crypto. Based on a study last month, more than half of Gen Z owns crypto. Whether they realize it or not, this is their collateral of choice. And the result of all of this is a market imperative for a way to leverage digital assets. This is why we created Anvil. Anvil is a DeFi protocol for on-chain collateral management that allows users to issue fully secured credit. Now that last bit might be a little bit confusing. I know the finance guys know what fully secured credit means, but when you're talking about credit and extending credit, it can be a little confusing. So let's rewrite that what we already know. Anvil is a DeFi protocol for collateral management that allows users to prove that they're good for it, right? So how does it work? It all starts with the vault. Users deposit digital assets into a central vault where then they can be leveraged as collateral throughout the entire protocol. When collateral is being utilized, it's reserved, which means it cannot be withdrawn and it cannot be double leveraged. Only the party that the credit is issued to can actually claim it, and this is how users can be provably good for it. Importantly, collateral remains associated with the issuer unless or until it becomes necessary to claim, so you are not giving up your assets early. The Anvil Vault currently accepts 14 different types of digital assets as collateral, although any ERC-20 is compatible so long as it passes our governance. We only launched a month ago, and we've already seen $17 million in collateral enter the vault. So let's talk about the two primary ways that that collateral can be leveraged within the protocol. And the first is in digital letters of credit, or locks. Locks are a digital promise from the creator to a beneficiary for accredited amount. It's a digital IOU that is guaranteed no matter what, and they come in two forms. The first is static. Static locks are a promise for a certain amount of digital token, let's say 25,000 USDC. That's backed by 25,000 USDC in collateral in the vault. And the second type are, dynamics, are dynamic locks. Dynamic locks are a promise of one token backed by collateral on another. So you're still promising that 25,000 USDC, but it could be backed by, let's say, your wrapped Ether. This allows the beneficiary party guaranteed credit in a token that they value while still being flexible enough to let the creator leverage the digital assets they already have. Dynamic locks are over-collateralized and subject to liquidation if the relative values start to diverge too much. This is exactly how Compound and Aave handle this. And here at the Acronym Foundation, we've published an open source liquidator in our repo that anyone can leverage, build on top of. Liquidations are permissionless. Anyone can do it and earn money doing so. And right now, at ETH Denver, one of our hackathon bounties is to have them make a new type of open source liquidator that leverages other DEXs. So yeah, run some liquidators, make some money, and help us put the D back in DeFi. It's important to note that regardless of whether you're making a static or dynamic lock, it shouldn't matter to whoever is accepting the lock. A guarantee is a guarantee, and how it's collateralized should ultimately be immaterial. So let's talk about some lock use cases. There are seemingly endless lock use cases, but I'm going to touch on a few, and then we'll deep dive into one. The first is guaranteeing consumer loans. We've already seen this happen in Europe. There's a company in Europe that will accept Anvil digital letters of credit and issue you at fiat loans against that. In fact, their entire value prop is same day euros in your bank account against your digital holdings. You don't have to sell out of your position to get access to fiat liquidity. And we just saw in the car loan example, right, that when you remove risk from a system, interest rates come down. That's a competitive advantage in the market. Facilitating international trade. This one's not a surprise. This is why analog letters of credit exist, right? Two parties across a border with disconnected financial systems trying to prove their credit worthy to each other. And so what happens, you have regional banks in between, middlemen, expenses, it takes a long time. If you use locks, it would be direct and instant and free. It's a better system. Payment and transfer settling. Guys, I'm done waiting for an ACH to clear. I, that, that's it, enough of it. And if you have to send an ACH, send a digital letter of credit that guarantees the amount in the interim. I'm not going to miss out on a week of trading because I'm waiting for an ACH to clear. That's ridiculous. We can do better. Auctions, gaming, and sports books. I'm, I'm really glad auctions is in here because so far we've only talked about times in which payment is inevitable. But think about what an auction is. You have to be good for it to bid, but you might not win, which means you might not actually have to transfer money in the end. And even in cases where guaranteed transfer is not actually guaranteed, locks still work. 
And for gaming and sports books, we see all the time, right, that casinos will offer markers to high rollers based on trust. We know how good that works, right? Anyone should be able to issue a digital letter of credit and be able to get a line of credit at any casino or sports book. I mean, think about what happens when you win. Think about this process, how it exists right now. You sell out of your digital assets, you get fiat, you take it out of the bank, you have to go to the casino, you go up to the cage, you exchange it for chips that represent those dollars, you put it on the table, all to cover a delta that you don't even know what it is yet, right? Locks can make huge progress in this industry. And the last is financial bridging. Locks are a great way to fa uh, facilitate bridging between chains. That one's pretty obvious, so let's talk about a more specific example. Maybe you can relate to this. Imagine your organization wants to reserve a booth at a crypto conference. The Acronym Foundation does it all the time. In fact, that's one that we've had in the past. These things are a hot commodity, right? They often book out a year in advance. They're competitive to get. They're often pretty expensive, depending on the size and location. But how does this actually happen? Well, from our experience, it looks like this. We contact the organizer. We agree to how much we're going to pay. We put it in a contract. We sign that. Then the organizer sends us an invoice. The invoice has net terms attached to it, let's say 30 days. And then we're contractually required to remit payment within 30 days to secure that booth. But do we really have to pay? Or can we just be good for it? Imagine that the booth costs $100,000. What if instead you issued a lock valid for a full year till the conference to the organizer for 100,000 USDT? You instantly reserve your spot. You don't, need, you don't need to part with your assets, so you're happy, but also the organizer's happy. They don't need to worry about whether you're gonna pay in those 30 days or what to do on day 31 or 32. Do we trust them? Should we hold on to the booth? Can we resell the booth at this point? They also don't need to worry about cancellation fees because locks can be partially redeemed. And here's where this gets awesome. What if the collateral you used is a yield-bearing asset? What if it's staked Ether or interest-bearing stablecoin? Let's say it earns 10% APY. So use 100,000 in a yield-bearing asset, lock it up for a year, reserve the booth, and then when the year is up, you send the $100,000 to the organizer, on-chain, off-chain, doesn't matter. Once they get that, they can cancel the lock, release the collateral back to you, you just kept all the upside. That's 10K you just made by using collateral efficiently. I want to talk to you guys about something that's been haunting me for over a decade that I think is going to drive this point home. When I got my first Amex, this is what I saw when I opened the app. Please pay by. What the hell is a please pay by date? It's not a due date, I can tell you that, because I looked at the terms and conditions. The due date was 15 days later. So why would Amex do this? Why would Amex, because they really want to help me pay on time? They're concerned about me? Does that sound like the credit card industry to you? No, exactly, because they know that if everybody pays their bill 15 days sooner, there's tremendous upside in just holding on to your money for 15 more days. And the problem is, is that TradFi institutions are set up to capture upside even in relatively short durations which is not the case for individuals or organizations outside of financial services. But this is why DeFi is the great equalizer. Now we have tools at our disposal to earn yield any time over any duration, 24, 7, 365. So I ask you again, why would you ever part with money one minute before you had to? Well, all this is related to locks and what locks can solve. We do have another mechanism. Locks are one-to-one -one in credit issuance. We also have a many-to-one option in terms of collateral pools. Through collateral pools, many users can contribute to the same pool for the benefit of a single claimant. This model is very common to insurance pools or staking pools. And while I think we're all familiar with those concepts, Let's look at an example that's happening right now. Flexa. You guys know Flexa? That's right. Flexa is the world's largest purely digital payment network. They allow merchants to accept crypto at point of sale. And in order to guarantee these payments, they reward users for participating in staking pools that backstop their network. Well, over the last few months, they've been running a successful beta through Anvil with users contributing about $2 million in collateral. And moving forward, I'm super excited that they'll be migrating their entire collateral system known as Flexi Capacity to Anvil's collateral pools. This likely represents $160 to $180 million in additional collateral that we expect to enter the protocol in the coming months. So let's look at the protocol from the top down. It's a vault, it's locks, it's letter of credits, but that's not the end. 
There are seemingly endless ways to leverage collateral and mechanisms to do so, and that's another bounty we're doing at ETH Denver right now. We're trying to find the next mechanism Anvil uses to solve real-world businesses and solve for market inefficiencies. And our engineering team has a full roadmap of tooling and expansion to ensure that, that, will, that we will continue to pioneer this space. So how can you get started? Well, first, you can interact with the contracts directly. All of our contracts have been published and verified on Etherscan. Also, the code can be found on the Acronym Foundation's GitHub. There's a README, docs on the website. And our contracts have been audited three times. Twice by Open Zeppelin, once by Trail of Bits. We've been through two Immunify audit competitions and an ongoing bug bounty program. The second way you can leverage Anvil is through our DAP. Our DAP exposes vault and lock functionality while also allowing you to participate in governance and track and claim your protocol rewards. And the last way, and this is the newest one, super excited about this, is our SDK. Our SDK allows easy access to functionality through customizable drop-in components, but it also aims to optimize the UX. We talked about all those use cases before. We need a UX that's flexible to handle all of those. That's what a good SDK should do. And we currently have an alpha library up and running that we'll continue to iterate on, expanding functionality and configuration. So please reach out to me if you're looking to integrate with our SDK because we can prioritize development towards your particular use case. All of these options can help you start leveraging on-chain collateral to enable such features as allowing your users to instantly trade and transact, operate on credit, access to seamless bridging, and much more. You can check out anvil.xyz. We got links to everything there, Discord, Medium, uh, GitHub, Twitter, all of our docs and protocol stuff, and our protocol governance. Uh, I'll be here all week. I'm m underscore at underscore anvil on Twitter and Telegram. You can also find me on Discord. Let's get together and talk about how your organization or your project can leverage Anvil to level up. I'll even buy you a coffee. Trust me, you know I'm good for it. Thank you, Denver. <laughs>